Hey everyone, you're watching the Esperanza 2 for 3. This is this is the Westing game part 5. Very exciting cuz in uh in part 4 we ended with um an article that Turtle was reading. The article was about um Sam Westing being found dead in his house, but it doesn't explain who was in there, what happened, and so on and so forth. Instead, it goes on the history of Sam Westing. Especially about fireworks. Hmm. And his estate be being estimated as $200 million. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so Turtle was thankful it didn't that the article didn't mention anything about how the body was found and so on and so forth. The only thing she had to worry about was losing her mother's cross. And then after that, the day was skipped to noon, where Otis Amber was delivering 16 letters, including one to himself, and he already knew what all of them said, considering that it was the same thing that he received. The reading of the will. Pretty exciting. <clears throat> so let's get to it. At noon, the 62 year old delivery boy began his rounds. He had 16 letters to deliver from E.G. Plum, attorney at law. Otis Amber knew what the letters said because one was addressed to him. As a named beneficiary in the estate of Samuel W. Westing, your attendance is required in the South Library of the Westing House tomorrow at 4 p.m. for the reading of the will. <clears throat> Means old man Westing left you some money, he explained. Just sign this receipt here. What do you mean? What does position mean? It means position, like a job. Most receipts have that to make sure the right person gets to the, gets the right letter. Grace Windsor Wexler wrote housewife, crossed it out, wrote, wrote decorator, crossed it out, and wrote heiress. Then she wanted to know who else, how many, how much. I ain't allowed to say nothing. The other heirs were too stunned by, by the unexpected legacy to bother him with questions. Madame Ho marked an X, and her husband filled in her name and position. Theo wanted to sign the receipt for his brother, but Chris insisted on doing it himself. Slowly, taking great pains, he wrote Christos Theodorakis, Birdwatcher. <laughs> Birdwatcher. By the time the sun had set behind the Sunset Towers parking lot, Otis Amber, deliverer, had completed his rounds. Chapter 5. Sixteen Heirs The marbled sky lay heavy on the gray Great Lake when Grace Windsor Wexler parked her car in the Westing driveway and strode up the walk ahead of her daughters. Her husband had refused to come, but no matter. Recalling family gossip recalling a family gossip about a wrench uncle. Maybe it was a great uncle. Anyway, his name was Sam. Grace had convinced herself that she was the rightful heir. Jake was Jewish, so he could not possibly be related to Samuel W. Westing. I can't imagine what became of my silver cross, she said, fingering the gold link necklace under her mink stole as she paused to appraise the big house. You know, Angela, we could have the wedding right here. Turtle, where are you wandering off? To now. The letter said... Never mind. Turtle preferred not to explain how she knew the library could be entered from the front doors on the lawn. Why does that remind me of an Agatha Christie game? 
The front door was opened by Crow. Although the Sunset Tower's cleaning woman always wore black, here it reminded Grace Wexler to dab at her eyes with a lace handkerchief. This was a house of mourning. The silent crow helped Angela with her coat and nodded approval of her blue velvet dress with white collar and cuffs. I'll keep my furs with me, Grace said. She did not want to be taken for one of the poor relatives. Seems rather chilly in here. Turtle, too, complained of the chill, but her mother tugged off her coat to reveal a fluffy, roughly pink party dress two sizes too large and four inches too long. It was one of Angela's hand-me-downs. Oh, poor turtle. Please sit anywhere, the lawyer said, without glancing from the envelopes he was sorting at the head of the long library table. Mrs. Wexler took the chair to his right and motioned to her favorite. Angela sat down next to her mother, removed a trousseau towel from her large tapestry shoulder bag, and took up embroidering the monogram D. Slumped in the third chair, Turtle pretended she had never seen this paneled library with its bare and dusty shelves. Suddenly, she sat up with a start. An open coffin, draped in bunting, rested on a raised platform at the far corner of the room. In it lay the dead man, looking exactly as she had found him. Except now he was dressed in the costume of Uncle Sam, including the tall hat. Between the waxy hands folded across his chest lay her mother's silver cross. What? <laughs> Grace was Grace Wexler was too busy greeting the next heir to notice. Why, Dr. D, I had no idea you'd be here. But of course, you'll soon be a member of the family. Come, sit next to your bride to be. Turtle, you'll have to move down. D. Denton Deer, always in a hurry, brushed a quick kiss on Angela's cheek. He was still wearing his hospital whites. I didn't know this was a pajama party, Turtle said, relinquishing her chair and stopping to the far end of the table. Touchy, touchy. The next heir, short and round, entered timidly, her lips pressed together in an impish smile that curved up to what must be pointed ears under her straight-cut, steely hair. Hello, Mrs. Bombot, Angela said. I don't think you've met my fiancé, Denton Deer. You're a lucky man, Mr. Deer. <clears throat> Doctor Deer, Mrs. Wexler corrected her, puzzled by the dressmaker's presence. Yes, of course. I'm so sorry. Sensing that she was unwelcome at this end of the room, Flora Bombach walked on. Hi, mind if I sit next to you? I promise not to pull your braid. That's okay. Turtle was hunched over the table, her small chin resting between her crossed arms. From there, she could see everything except the coffin. Grace Wexler dismissed the next heir with an audible tongue click. That distasteful little man didn't even have the sense to remove his silly aviator's cap. Tisk. And what in heaven's name was he doing here? The delivery boy shouted, Let's give a cheer. Otis Amber is here. <laughs> Turtle laughed. Flora Bombach tittered, and Grace Wexler again clicked her tongue. Tisk. 
Doug Ho and his father entered silently, but Sandy gave a hearty hi and a cheery wave. He wore his doorman's uniform, but unlike Otis Amber, carried his hat in his hand. Grace Windsor Wexler was no longer surprised at the odd assortment of heirs. Household workers all, or former employees, she decided. The rich always reward servants in their wills, and her Uncle Sam was a generous man. Aren't your parents coming? She asked the older Theodorakis as he wheeled his brother into the library. They weren't invited, Theo replied. It's, oh, in, Chris announced. What did he say? He said it's snowing. Theo and Flora Bombach explained at the same time. The heirs watched helplessly as the inbound's thin frame was suddenly torn and twisted by convulsions. Only the dressmaker rushed to his side. I know, I know, she simpered. You are trying to tell us about the itsy bitsy snow queens. Theo moved her away. My brother is not an infant, and he's not retarded, so please, no more baby talk. <laughs> Blinking away tears, Flora Bombach returned to her seat, the elfin smile still painted on her painted face. Some stared at the afflicted child with morbid fascination, but most turned away. They didn't want to see. Pyramidal tract involvement, Denton Deer whispered, trying to impress Angela with his diagnosis. Angela, her face a mirror to the boy's suffering, grabbed her tapestry bag and hurried out of the room. I think I'm going to stop there considering my voice is getting hoarse and I need to save it for later on tonight. I'm going to do the next video recording for my walkthrough. Pretty exciting! Alright, I will see you guys later. This is CS Bronze 243, signing off.